No song this week? No. Oh. I'm not opposed to it. But then it would be a tradition. <laughs> Good morning, folks. Maybe everyone over here just needs to move, and then I could just... It'd be great. Well, I want to welcome you to the Lord's house today. And I also, of course, say Happy Mother's Day to all of you moms that are here. We're thankful for you. And as husbands, we're especially thankful that you continue to put up with us. <laughs> Wonderful. I hope you brought your Bibles. Once again, we're turning to the book of Ecclesiastes for some more edification and instruction. You know, it's always amazing to me as I could do these studies that something that was literally written thousands of years ago can be just as fresh and just as applicable today as the very day that it was written. I don't know about you, but most everything I hear in God's house, I can take and I can apply literally that minute, the instant I hear it, I can start applying it. That's the nature of God's word. If you would, take your Bibles, and we're opening them now to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and we're going to look at verses 5 through 10. We're making our way through the middle of chapter 7. And Solomon has just finished up, of course, a pretty lengthy address on the nature of worldly wealth and our relationship to what we own. And then in chapter 7, he's shifting gears a little bit, and he's giving some different exhortations, some little small packages of truth on different topics, and they all fall under the main theme of the book. Does anyone remember what the main theme of this book is? It's a question. What is the meaning of life? What is the meaning or the purpose of life? So last time, last Sunday, we spoke on the priority of having a serious attitude and also what sorrow or mourning can teach any person that's willing to listen, how that is more instructive to us than foolishness or laughter or mirth. We had a contrast between happiness and sadness, between a heart of wisdom, right, and a heart of foolishness. And so that kind of that basic contrast is going to continue into the text for today, except in these verses, we have some practical application that's made in the area of earthly oppression or difficulty. And the truth that's portrayed by Solomon is regardless of what your spiritual condition is, all men living on this earth are going to face some level of difficulty and hardship just because it's a fallen world that we live in. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. Chapter 4 highlighted an unfortunate reality when Solomon said, I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. And you should remember during that earlier study I tried to make a connection for us, focusing on the fact that without a relationship with God, people only have themselves to rely on, and only their own tears as comfort when things get hard. And all of that really is nothing more than vanity at the end of the day. And so there's a similar theme present here and some similar teaching for us today. Once again, I'm going to seek to bring a spiritual component or application into the message because without that, we're limited to the wisdom this world can provide, which is really pretty vain. So the main thing that stands out to me as I read through these verses really is the question of how do I respond when situations or circumstances in this life don't go the way that I want them to? How do I personally deal with frustrations or trials in life? How do we behave when difficulty and hardship are just a normal part of our experience here? Because that shouldn't come as a surprise to us. Even though we know that there is a right way to respond to difficulty, we know that intellectually, You'll often find believers acting just like unbelievers when the going gets tough. I shared a comparison the preacher made between two types of people in the last several studies. Hopefully you remember, we have the man that was content by virtue of his right relationship with God. And then we have the man that was living a life of constant turmoil because of his lack of spiritual peace. Now, we're not talking about finances anymore, but there are still two different people very much in view here in this passage, and one we might call the spiritual man, and the other we could refer to as the carnal man. And so your objective as you listen is to look for similarities between the way that each person is described here in Scripture and then your own actions and tendencies, because that's where the application comes in. Now, I'll tell you, no true Christian is characteristically carnal. 
That is key. That's important to understand. But we certainly can act very unspiritual and carnal at times, can't we? Yes, we can. I find that starting from the moment of salvation, the work of comparing myself and my attitude to Scripture is one of the single most powerful tools that God has given to us for our personal sanctification and growth. That's what we must do. That's why it's called a mirror. We should always be willing to take a hard look at ourselves and our natural responses when situations in this life are less than ideal. So this morning what we have before us is a crash course for the Christian's duty when things just don't seem to be working out. When we're facing an uphill battle in some area, when some type of oppression or difficulty enters our lives. Our attitude when bad things happen will make all the difference in the world when it comes to what God is trying to accomplish with our lives. And so I pray that the remainder of these verses will be as powerful and as useful to you as they are to me. So let's read the passage, and we'll see what the Lord has for us this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 5 says, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity." Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. All right, so coming right on the heels of Solomon's earlier instruction about having a proper and wise attitude, we have some practical exhortations about how this type of attitude will shape our actions or our behavior. Every person is given the choice in how they will respond to difficulties. And part of becoming spiritually mature means that our natural impulses are kept under control by biblical principle. To do that, they must be submitted to God's will. What must we do when faced with some type of a hardship or a personal challenge? I'll give you four points that Solomon highlights throughout this text. Number one, if you're dealing with some kind of a trial, the first thing that you need to do is be willing to listen to the rebuke of the wise. Listen to the rebuke of the wise. At all times, we must be willing to open our ears to words of wisdom and close our mouths to speaking foolishness. Verse 5 tells us it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Basically, it's better to be rebuked by a wise man than soothed by the words of a fool. Why is it so important, or why is this so important when it comes to earthly trials, difficulties, oppression? Folks, it's important because the truth is there are many troubles that come into our lives purely because of our own foolishness or carnality. Now, no doubt all of us will have to endure things in this life that we really have no control over. All Christians will have to suffer things that are truly not their fault to some degree or another. But there's a whole other category of personal personal difficulty that we might be subjected to because of poor decision-making or an unspiritual attitude. Have any of you ever really stepped in it in life? I'm talking about a time when you have said or you have done something that created some tremendous problems or hardships. I believe that all of us have probably done something like this, and if you haven't, that means you haven't been around long enough. Most of us have probably done this, speaking for myself, on more than one occasion. We've created a negative situation And then incredibly, we've gotten frustrated with what's happening even though we are really the root cause, if we get right back to it. Sometimes it can be very hard for us to discern the fact that we are the problem in the situation. And that's just because our natural human tendency is to shift blame away from ourselves, misconstrue any criticism, and then justify our actions. That's the flesh. That's what the flesh always seeks to do. That comes very easily and naturally to most people because that's the nature of the old man. But this kind of response will completely blind us to the fact that some of the things a Christian will face in their life 
come about as a direct result of their own foolish or unbiblical decisions. When you have put yourself or others in a bad spot through poor decision making, the absolute worst thing that you could do is continue to justify yourself by trying to make allies with like-minded and foolish people. How often do people try to do that? When this verse speaks of the song of fools, what it's talking about is the, the pacifying effect that similarly minded people often have on one another. And you'll see that. People tend to group in groups of people that are like them. If you respond to a challenge or a difficulty by seeking self-affirmation or justification from those that only ever agree with you, what you're really doing is blinding yourself even further to the real nature of the situation. The thoughts and opinions of others can and they will have a tremendous impact on you for good or for bad. If we are looking for allies in a situation rather than seeking true wisdom, what started off as a bad situation is only going to become much, much worse. So we see here in verse 5 that rebuke, Rebuke is a very strong correction. It's like the strongest word in the Bible for being corrected. That is better than pacification. This is only, that's because only the application of wisdom can really show you the nature of a trial or difficulty. Is this a situation that I have created somehow? Am I the one responsible for the trouble? Is there something in this that needs to be repented of and forsaken or is it something that's truly out of my control? Sound judgment on the nature of the difficulty is needed. Proverbs 6.23 tells us, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and the reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Reproof, though we may not like it, is one of the primary means that God uses to deal lovingly with his children. Though our natural tendency is self-preservation and self-protection, we must be willing to seek the perspective of the wise. Your first move, folks, when you encounter something that seems like oppression, persecution, or hardship, your first move should be to seek the counsel of those that you know are wise, spiritually-minded folks, unbiased folks, objective folks. Rather than holding a pity party, gathering together a bunch of people you know will agree with you, and collectively affirming one another, you go to the person that you know will tell you the truth. You go to the person that maybe doesn't always make you feel good, but you have confidence will give you a godly perspective on the situation. That they won't spare your feelings for the sake of the truth. Folks, that's the path of life. When it, the Bible talks about God or David requesting that God would reveal his secret faults to him, this is exactly what he's talking about, perspective on the issue. The path of death is really to just blunder your way through every hardship, feeling sorry for yourself, comparing yourself with others that are just like you, and ultimately learning absolutely nothing from the situation. That is not honoring to God, but sadly, that is what many, many people do when something hard comes into their life because they're not really willing to deal with what the root issue even in times when we really mess up, God is trying to teach us something. Are we going to make good use of those times? Or are, they going to, are we going to squander them on our own self-protection? Now you'll notice the extra information that Solomon gives us on this song of fools. What does verse 6 say? It says, For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. When you seek the wrong type of advice and when you try to self-justify, you're going to, you're always going to find this kind of thing. Because there will always be people out there that will tell you what you want to hear. Whether in person, in a book, or on the internet, you can always confirm your opinions on something if you look hard enough. And though this type of foolish influence, it might warm your thoughts or your emotions for a brief time, the picture in this verse is that it produces nothing of lasting value and it's actually very detrimental. The crackling of thorns under the pot, it gives us the picture of trying to cook food using nothing but the lightest of tinder. You know, you might be able to produce a bright flame maybe, make some light and a little bit of heat for a while, but without more substantial pieces of fuel, without the wisdom, the rebuke of the wise, that fire is just going to put itself out. And then your food, it's not going to cook, it's going to spoil. 
When you turn to foolish or pacifying counsel, you might find some measure of warmth or self-gratification, but you're not going to be edified. You're not going to be growing through the situation, and your spiritual life will be stunted rather than strengthened. So the first thing that we must be willing to do when facing any kind of earthly trial or difficulty is to get perspective. Seek the perspective of the wise and godly. I would also, this isn't in my notes, but just say that that perspective is supposed to come and occur in the context of the Lord's church. One of the things people try to do many times when there's some issue in a church, they start reaching to folks outside that either don't have perspective or don't have the benefit of being part of a sound church, they get a bunch of useless opinions and they bring those back and try to apply them to a situation going on in here and it just creates division and it creates more problems. When you go and you seek somebody that, that I'm talking about that's wise here, that should be someone that is well familiar with you, someone in the context of your own church. So we have to be willing to do that. And if there is rebuke present in that council, you know, you go to somebody and you're thinking the situation was this way and it actually flips and it's actually a different way, you need to be willing to listen to that. You need to be willing to take heed, or we do, to take heed how we hear and make any changes that are necessary. It's a really good thing, even if it's painful, to find out there's something I need to change about this situation. Now, continuing on, Solomon makes an observation about oppression in verse 7. He says, Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. Now, what this is talking about is that even the wise, by worldly standards, they can be corrupted or destroyed by the effects of oppression. This is why it's so critical that we have spiritual sight on such matters. The phrase, a gift destroyeth the heart, it's talking about the way that oppression or the taking of bribes sears the conscience and turns even a wise man into nothing more than a petty criminal. It's, a, it's kind of a worldly example of it. The word gift literally means bribe. So our next point comes not from verse 7, but actually from verse 8, which says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. So in addition to the, the need I mentioned before, to open our ears to wisdom, even if that wisdom takes the form of a rebuke, the Bible says that when encountering difficulties, we must be sure that our spirit is right before God. This verse says that a person that is patient in spirit is far better off than the one that is proud in spirit. Are you starting to see the two different personalities developing in Solomon's address here? One individual is willing to listen to wisdom, and he has an attitude of humility and patience. The other opens his ears to foolishness and is ruled by pride. Again, I'm trying to bring a spiritual application into this. We understand that the one that is wise, humble, and patient is all of those things only by the grace and enablement of God. And so we see that when we respond to unfortunate events, number two, we must be patient in spirit. That's pretty basic, right? We need to be patient in spirit. We have a responsibility to patiently and calmly bear up and under any number of oppressions or difficulties in life. Patience or being long-suffering, it's a fruit of the spirit. It's a chief part of God's character, a component of his character. It's the difference between going through a trial in a way that pleases God and being hauled through the same situation, kicking and screaming. A patient spirit manifests itself in our conduct towards others and towards life in general. Are you a person that characteristically finds yourself in extreme impatience at the slightest opposition or challenge? Do you find yourself chafing at everything and everyone all of the time? This could be a symptom of a proud and impatient spirit. I can tell you as one that has struggled with patience all of my life that impatience with situations and especially impatience with others it comes from pride, directly from pride. It comes from having a very high evaluation of my own importance. I can't believe he just cut me off on the exit ramp. How dare he? Doesn't he realize how important my time is? Doesn't he realize how important I am? Or why is this frustrating situation happening with the children again? They should know I don't have time to deal with this over and over and over. 
This kind of thing is so beneath me. I have more important things to do. Whether you say that verbally or not, we've all said it as parents. We have. This kind of frustration and impatience is exponential because the more important what I'm doing is to me, the more impatient I will be with the things that distract or pull away from that. Why can't things just go my way for once? Why me? Why me? It really all comes back to a laser focus on self and my own importance. To such a person, and I have been that person at times, I would ask, how is the air way up there in your castle? Friends, pride and a spirit of impatience will destroy just about everything good in short order. It's never good to be impatient. It's never spirit-led to respond to trials or difficulties this way. It's always a fleshly response. So what is our attitude in the midst of a storm? Compare your attitude and your own responses to what we see in this verse. And as you're doing so, notice that verse 8 says something else that's very interesting, and it speaks to the need to have the proper spirit. Why does Solomon write, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof? Because we are living the Christian life to learn how to be more like Christ. That's the point. And you don't become godlier without going through some things. Have you ever encountered a situation that you thought was going to be the worst possible thing for you, but at the end of all of the trouble, and maybe the suffering, you found that you were actually better for having experienced it? I still remember when some things came to a head with a religious organization that we were a part of before God showed my wife and I what a church was, before we were baptized into this body. I'll never forget, because it was my birthday when the pastor from there told me that he was being forced to leave by a decision made by an elder board. Now at the time, with my very, very limited understanding, I mean, I'd been saved for like three, maybe six months. That seemed like a terrible thing, a terrible thing. I can tell you it made for one miserable birthday present. But if that had not happened, I would not have learned what a scriptural church is I would not have been sensitized to some of the unbiblical conduct of that elder board. And ultimately, folks, I don't think I would be standing in front of you this morning. The last five years would have played out very differently. But we couldn't learn from that without going through it. And so many times in life, we waste the opportunities that God gives to us simply because we're not willing to go through hard things or deal with them appropriately. The end of a thing is better than the beginning. Not because God has some type of sick sense of humor, but because he has so much to teach us by bringing us through things. Where do you learn to trust God the most? Is it when it's all rainbows and butterflies? No, in fact, I would argue that rainbows and butterflies makes for some very weak Christians. You learn to trust God when you have nothing left but God. When people turn away from you, when life disappoints, or when things just don't turn out the way that you'd hoped. And so our attitude and our response to earthly oppression, our patience, it creates an opening for the Lord to do some really amazing things in your life. All we have to do is listen to the right voices, seek wisdom, and maintain a spirit of patience and humility. Do you know what I have to remind myself of so often to deal with my own pride? Jed, he could have destroyed you the instant that you sinned against him. God let me live, which means that he intends that I view life, good, bad, or ugly, as a gift. All of this is by his grace. How could I ever find myself lifted up but with pride when I remember that? And really, how could any of us? How could I find myself irritated with the trials of life when I should have been cast into hell? If you're manifesting impatience about any of this, Please remember the truth of the matter. All right, we're talking about the Christian's proper response to earthly oppression. We don't want to respond to life in a carnal way. And Ecclesiastes is helping us to make sure our decisions and our actions are motivated by spiritual priorities. So the next verse, verse 9, deals with another fleshly activity that goes right along with what we've already discussed. This is a great verse, especially for men. It says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. You know, I was just talking to a brother yesterday about teaching children by example. 
what happens when you're the dad laying under that car and the wrench slips off the bolt and you full on punch the underside of the car? Has anyone else done that, by the way? Yeah. How do you respond? Your, your little boys are standing right there watching you. How do you respond? Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. Don't be fast to get angry. It says, because anger is present in the heart of fools. When faced with earthly hardships, we must, number three, avoid haste and anger. What does James 1, 19 through 20 say? It says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be every man swift, or let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. This verse in James is spoken it's in the context of how, specifically how we respond to the word of God. But it is just as applicable to the situation described here in Ecclesiastes. Solomon speaks of an emotional reaction to difficulty or oppression, a response to injustice, and particularly the kinds of things that sinful men might commit one to another. Let me ask you something. When somebody wrongs you or life doesn't work out the way you'd hoped, is it easy to justify the emotion of anger? You mean to self-justify that? Oh yeah, you better believe it's easy. After all, why shouldn't shouldn't we be angry at injustice? Shouldn't we lash out and defend our rights? Shouldn't we set people straight? Isn't it appropriate for you to resent the fact that you're enduring some kind of unpleasant situation? I mean, this is the message that's literally shouted from the rooftops in our culture. You're oppressed. And you have every right to be upset and angry about it. This is the kind of foolishness that would have one group of people seeking reparations from another group of people based on sins committed by completely different people in the past. Our natural tendency when we're wounded is to lash out at whatever is bringing the pain. That's the response of the lost man. And it's hasty and it's angry. But when we speak of oppression and hardship encountered by the Christian, what are we really talking about? Is there anything, as a believer, that comes into your life without God's knowledge and permission? When you pray about something, is that the first time God's hearing about it? (laughs) No, that's ridiculous, and we would never think that. But what are we saying when we get angry at things that come into our lives? We might say we're upset with the circumstances, but we are really angry at God. Anger at trials and difficulties is really just anger at God. If he has allowed something to come into your life and you get frustrated at your experience, you're frustrated at the one that allowed it. We need to be very careful with this kind of thing. It's pretty easy to pretend that we're angry at circumstances when really we're just acting out of resentment against the Lord. And again, if we listen to the words of the wise, is there a needed rebuke looming over our heads? Are we angry about something that we brought on ourselves? We often speak about people being turned away, right, from salvation by tragedy or by all the evil in the world. And we know that's not a valid response. And yet, how quickly do we do the same kind of thing in our relationship to God? If you really loved me, you would deliver me from this. Why aren't you protecting me? Why is this happening? Rather than taking some time to listen to wisdom and measure our responses, it's often the case that we act rashly. We allow ourselves to be motivated by anger and other sinful feelings, and we end up completely tanking any opportunity we would have to grow through an event. We are so desperate sometimes to make sure that we never experience hardship, we forget that this, to a large degree, is how God molds and sanctifies his people. Now, I'm not calling anyone out by saying this, but what I am asking is that we should all be careful to think about the negative situations in our lives And then think about what our first response to those types of times was. What was the first thing that we did or thought? Were we motivated out of haste or anger? Or did we practice patience, humility, and a measured approach to the situation? I think as we consider this, all have some areas that need additional work and attention. I know that I do. The end of the verse says, Anger resteth in the bosom of fools. This is very meaningful. Those of you that have heard my testimony know what an angry, angry person I was before Christ saved me. Anger is still something I need to put down on almost a daily basis. But how appropriate to connect the emotion of anger to the attitude of the fool. 
It is the fool that would fight back against what God has allowed in his life. It's the fool that would move with inappropriate haste without considering his actions. And it's the fool that, though he may produce great light and heat for a short time, brings about no lasting change or benefit to anybody. This verse should serve as a strong warning to those of us that still deal with anger, especially an angry or a hasty spirit. Above everything we've talked about this morning, what verse 9 is talking about, I think, has the greatest potential to make the most damage. With fleshly responses, we can take a relatively minor setback and we can turn it into an all-consuming problem with far-reaching effects. Let's all be very guarded in our attitudes and be sure we're not concealing some type of resentment against God behind a frustration with circumstances. Now, I have one more point I want to bring before you this morning. And then we will conclude. And I apologize that I am a snotty mess. I think it might be allergies. Verse 10 tells us, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. I love this verse. And I I especially love the way our Bible renders this. Thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. You know how I would say that? It's a stupid question. Don't, you shouldn't be asking that question. So we are to respond to difficulty by listening to the rebuke of the wise, being patient in spirit, avoiding haste and anger. And now, to summarize everything, we must, number four, choose to trust God. Make a choice to give him the things that we have no control over. And we even need to give him and let us guide through the things that we have a little control over. You'll notice the question presented in this verse. Well, whatever happened to the good old days, right? Why was the past so much better than what I'm going through now? Again, the context is all of the oppression and trial and difficulty a person might encounter while living life under the sun. And his response to this shift in his quality of life is wanting to go back to a time when there were less cares and worries. Do any of you do what my wife and I do sometimes where we have a little sidebar conversation where we're like, do you remember how simple things were? Like right back when we were first married and yet we had no clue, did we? Like we had so much time and so few responsibilities and such a small level of stress and you're kind of like, oh, that'd be... But then you look at what you have now and you just feel (laughs) foolish even for complaining about it. But it is true. Our response to that shift is sometimes to want to go back to a time when life was more comfortable. I love the exhortation given in this verse, like I said, Thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. It's a stupid question. You're, acting, you're asking the wrong kind of question of God. The question is not, why have these things come into my life, or why is my life harder than it used to be? The right question is, Lord, what would you have me to learn or do through this. Now, I recognize that it is very easy for me to stand up here and say this, you know, as though I'm glibly skirting around all of the terrible things that a person might have to deal with in their life. And no, in no way am I trying to minimize the impact of some of the challenges we face and will continue to face. And God is not trying to minimize them either. But what he is trying to emphasize here is the importance of having a spiritual attitude. No matter what comes into our lives, Remember that I told you there are two different people mentioned in this text. Characteristics on one side and on another. Can you guys see them now? The spiritual person is willing to listen to wisdom, practices patience and humility, is not angry and hasty, and trusts in the Lord. The carnally motivated person, they're pacified, they're blinded by foolishness, they're proud in spirit and angry, and rather than trusting God, they complain and they wish for easier times. Which of these two people is going to learn the lessons that God intends through what he lets into their life? Which of them is going to be a blessing to others that are dealing with the same kinds of things? Which of them is going to advance the kingdom of God rather than hindering the ministry of the gospel? Do we understand that beyond our relationship to wealth, our attitude about oppression and hardship will be another of the most important determining factors of whether we're fruitful workers for God or frankly, a waste of resources. This is such an important subject for us to absorb and also to take action on. 
If we cannot even handle the relatively small bumps in the road that God sends our way, how can we possibly expect to be faithful when something a little more serious comes our way? It's kind of like preaching the gospel. If a person is too scared to preach in our current environment, how are they possibly going to be faithful if things get a little bit tougher? Truth is that in both scenarios, people don't become more faithful by accident. If we're not having the right responses to the challenges we face now, then we certainly shouldn't expect to have a God-honoring attitude later on when something more serious happens. You know, there's a saying in my line of work, you don't rise to the occasion, you fall to your training. And while that's a temporal example, that's exactly what's being talked about here. So the question on this point is, how do you trust God in the middle of something unpleasant? Well, it's not done through some type of a mental handoff where you just kind of give it to God. Trust is a very active thing. When we trust God, when we really trust him, then we're going to practice the principles of his word right in the middle of the hardship. He's concerned about much more than us just having some type of mental peace despite an ordeal. He desires that we would grow to be more like him through the situation and that we'd be a light and a testimony of his wisdom by how we react to it. That is why all the fleshly responses we already spoke about, why they're so damaging. The result, or they result in the believer having a testimony that's really no different than that of the world's. Any lost man can suffer through something with dogged determination and stoicism. We see stories of people doing that all the time. Christians are supposed to respond to trials and difficulties with joy, counting it a privilege to suffer some of the same things that their Lord suffered. So number one, trusting God, it means that you refrain from asking foolish questions. If you know his will, then you're not going to be wanting to go back to the good old days. Also, trusting God means you choose to be content despite the circumstances. You don't try to control everything and you don't give in to fear or worry. Paul said that he had learned to be content in all kinds of circumstances. And he didn't do this by always being delivered from them, did he? When we cast all our cares on the Lord, it means that we choose to do what he says to do, even when we don't feel like doing it. We trust that he knows best, even when our natural response, what comes easy, is to be proud, hasty, angry, and all the rest. I hope you notice that the opportunity for growth is totally wasted on the one that's looking back for easier days. That is a clear sign that someone is not trusting in God, not submitting to his will, and not relying on the fact that he really does know what's best for us. And so the direction for us in this is clear. As believers, as those of us that have the benefit of spiritual sight and the blessing of truth, we can see which of those two people that our lives should exemplify. And so as I close, or we close, I'd ask, which of those two people are you most like in real life? As you think back on the different things that have come into your experience, what has been your go-to response? The idea is that the Lord, through the application of his word and exhortation, would make us into a people that honor him regardless of the circumstances. That we would trust and apply his truths right in the middle of the problems that we face, and that we'd build one another up and grow to be wise as he molds and shapes us by his grace. So as you resolve to honor him in some trying times, don't forget to listen to the wise, seek the wise out, shun foolish counsel, be patient. Fruit takes time to grow. Stay away from any hasty or rash impulses, turn away from anger, and above all, keep trusting the Lord just as actively as the day that he saved you. That's the way to come through oppression and trials of life with victory. James 5, 7 through 10 says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren, the apostles, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. 
it's amazing how much truth such a short passage can communicate in a short time because I could have just skipped that entire message and read that passage to you and it would have said the same thing. So let's all make application today.